The Steve Austin Show is brought to you free today by our friends at Bet Online. Get in the mix at betonline.ag and use the promo code PODCAST1 for your 50% welcome bonus. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts and exclusive partner of Podcast One Sportsnet. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. I was talking to Jesse Ventura, Jesse the Body, about everything under the sun. Of course, I had to get some wrestling questions in there. I didn't want to go too much politics. You know, Jesse's very political, uh, and he loves his politics, but we wanted to cover the book. But I would talk about some wrestling first. And that Shepard's bigger, but the Malinois faster and actually has a stronger bite. Are they still prone to the hip dysplasia? No. That, okay. Not at all, because they're only 75 pounds. Gotcha. Those are usually the dogs that are 90 to 100 will get the hip trouble. Although my dog is got some arthritis. You know, he's got it. Are you giving it the glucosamine or any of the other yeah, stuff? Yeah, plus we're giving him this magnetic. Have you seen those magnetic hoops? No. Oh. Is it like the, the bands they advertise on television? They, you push a button, it's battery, it's a hoop, and you put, you can use two at once, and you put it, you have the dog lie down, and you put it where his hurt spots are, and by God, it works. I don't know what this magnetism does. But when we, my wife treats him twice a day, and when he's getting it good, all of a sudden he's walking better, he's feeling better, he's doing all, and it's and it's just these magnetic coop things that apparently they work good with arthritis and joints and all that stuff. Okay, what about the human being? Will it work on a human being? I don't I need know. One of those hoops. I don't know. How are you feeling? Me? Yeah, I'm all right. Why? No, I mean, you're, oh, you're, I, I had my hip done. Yeah, you know, and I, I had. But I mean, the, you come back from that. I mean, yeah, well, I had that in '08, and uh, I got the new technique at the time called hip resurfacing. Are yeah, you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Where they do, they cut you, but you, they don't cut your femur. They just cover your uh, uh, ball and socket with carbon titanium steel and put you back together like a new asphalt road. I do, I do anywhere right now from 24 to 40 miles a week on the elliptic machine. Right now, what kind of pace you setting? I mean, I, are, you, are, I, you, are you breathing? You got to. I, I do. I do a pace of where I get in uh, between six and three quarter miles and seven. So I'm doing sub, you know, nine minute miles on an elliptic machine, which is going pretty good. I'm running it at about seventy three, seventy four. On you the do dial. that every day. I try to, and then I do a hundred repetitions per body part of weights, but I do them now where every set is 20 reps. I, I was reading light. that because you lightened up your training at the time. I, I watched so many of your interviews, and I was, I was, I'm working my way through Marijuana Manifesto, and yeah. obviously we're going to talk about that. That's why you're in L.A. doing the rounds. Sure, sure. But I read that you, for a while, it was about a four-month period, you stopped lifting weights, but then you said, no, you're doing the high-rep stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. Just, I just came back from rotator cuff surgery. I got, the, I got this big idea, Jesse, that I needed to be strong again at 51. So I get this heavy, heavy and at fifty one, it's okay. But well, it was. I, I end up doing my rotator cuff you again, and then went to mania, oh, boy. did it further, detached my biceps. Well, so now my my mindset on where I need to be is: I don't care how strong I am. N- n- neither does anybody else. So I just want to look good. I want to feel good. End of story. Increase increase your repetitions and go lighter. How long did it take you to figure that out? Because Not, you were heavy into the bodybuilding scene. Oh, yeah. It, it took me, it, well, it really took me when my body started to fall apart. When the when hip went, the 2008, hip. the okay. hip. And I also discovered through wrestling that uh, my pelvis had been out of alignment for over 20 years. And that was causing me back trouble. So I, I, I went to a physical therapist in Mexico who discovered it. He said, your back problems because your pelvis has been out of alignment. And I remember when I took the bump and did it. Really? I really remember it. I took some crazy backdrop. And I remember I thought it was weird. It was one of them, you've done it, yeah. where you take that bump and it didn't seem like it should have seemed. And, uh, and lo and behold, I think that's what caught He said, because I play a ton of golf. And I'd have to go to the chiropractor every other week. He said, we get your pelvis aligned. You're not going to have this back trouble. So now I do stretches, and I've got my pelvis back in alignment. Plus, believe it or not, do you ever see on TV the teeter hanger? Yeah, yeah. The upside down. I have one of them in Mexico, one of them in Minnesota, and I can't tell you they are phenomenal. So you believe in it? Oh, 
I do it every day for five to ten minutes. I hang completely upside down to where you actually go into a a state like uh, upside down. I call it my Dracula position, you know, like a so bat. It, does it decompress you because you're you know it's you're getting gravitational cold pushed? Yeah. And and you actually feel your spine's alignment again. I do it every day without fail at the end of my workout for ten to fifteen minutes. Ten minutes, or I'll, I'll hang upside down. I play. I haven't seen a chiropractor now in over two years. All right, based on that endorsement, I'm going to try one because oh. anything to me. I, you know, and and that being said, but you got to do it gradual, Steve. Oh, really? Don't yeah, don't go there the first day and hang upside down. See, I'm no, that guy. It's, it's got no, it's got straps on it. Right. So for the first week or so, just go to the first strap level. Then when you're comfortable with that, go to the second one. Okay. Then it'll take you about three weeks till you're completely inverted. And then, and then the key is, like, I, I, I relax with my mind. I'll say, okay, because you, you naturally tense because you're yeah. upside down. I'll say to my feet, relax. My calves, ankles, relax. And I'll go, I'll go literally down my whole body telling it to relax. And pretty soon you almost go into a subconscious sleep upside down. And you just hang there. And then when you come off it, the cool thing about coming off it, you feel like you're three inches taller again. Right. You walk perfectly upright. Your posture's perfect. And you feel like, God, I'm still 6'4". <laughs> well, you, and I've seen so many guys, when, when we walked up, and you walked up on the sidewalk, and you came early. This is the earliest podcast I've ever done. And it's great to see you, but you're still 6'4". You see a lot of guys. I think so. Well, I'm probably you see six a lot of three. Guys and, and they're just so much shorter than they were in their prime. Yeah. And going back to the uh, the back machine, you know, hanging upside down. I'm one of those all or nothing types. So I would get one. and I just go. Straight no, up, down, don't do that because you could hurt minutes. yourself. Yeah. You could hurt. No, do it gradual. Do it for a month. Do it for each phase. Do for about ten days till you're real comfortable with it. And then when you finally do, then you get so comfortable. Like I said, you almost go into a, a subconscious sleep when you hang upside down. And when you come off it, you feel great. And I haven't been to chiropractor in over two years now. Well, that's that, that you talking about that just begs this question because I've watched so many of your interviews. You've been so busy since you left the business through Hollywood, you know, your Navy SEALs career. Yes and writing. no. Yes and no. Because well, well, for ten, Steve, is, for ten straight years now, I've gone and lived off the grid for four months a year down in Mexico. Yeah, but you keep cranking <laughs> out these books. I That's why I write. Mexico, but, That's why I write. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you hanging upside down? Is there any other time where you can turn your brain off? Because you always seem you're so engaged. And uh, something you are just totally committed to it, and I just don't see a whole lot of relaxation time. Mexico. Okay. That's why I live two separate lives. I live a life up here right now where it's go, 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 and, and, and do the things I do. And then when winter comes, I don't even fly there. I drive there. It's a five-day trip, and I live off the grid. I live an hour from pavement and an hour from electricity. Is it a safe drive? I've driven the Baja nine times now from top to bottom, and I would tell you this. It's something everyone needs to put on their bucket list. Because it's a drive where every time I do the drive, it's a new adventure. Not meaning of, of being scared or safety. Right. Uh, I see and do things down there that nowhere else can you do them. There's, there's places when I'll drive there where I'll pull the car over and we'll get out of the car, my wife and I and the dog, and uh, the silence is deafening. You, the, it, it's loud. You can't describe when silence is loud, but it's loud. And the only way I know humans exist, I can do a 360, is the road. Right. Because there's nothing else there. And and I've actually, here's something I tell people. They've said, well, what can you do in Mexico you can't do here? And I'll state this. I had an experience down there I rate in my top five. I went to a small lagoon, my wife and I, and we were taken out by Mexican guides in 19-foot bonka boats, and I touched gray whales in the wild, and I stuck my hands in their mouths and rubbed their gums. And, and, and we had a mother and baby spend 50 minutes with us where we actually babysat the mom's baby, and she went off to the side. I heard you tell that story. Oh. My deal is, how big is the gray whale? 40 feet. 
and they're just, twice the length. Did you shovel men? Are they just out there and they don't no, care? They're no, no. What, what ha- this started from an old Mexican man who in this lagoon who developed a rapport with them. He passed it on to other Mexicans. Now it's protected. The government protects this lagoon. The mother gray whales bring their babies there to train them before they go to Alaska because the killer whale is their predator. And the killer whale's like a bike club. They hunt in packs, yeah. and uh, and so so the it reminds me of your days with the Mongols. Yeah. Well, anyway, that aside, yeah. but uh, but uh, so so they train, and the killers won't come into this lagoon. Well, clearly the whales can communicate because how would they know it's safe to interact with man right. after what we've done to them? And yet, what you do, they take you to a place in the lagoon and you splash water and you have fun, and the whales that want to interact with you will come to you. There were probably 50 of them in the lagoon. I probably saw 50 whales in this lagoon. And pretty soon this big mother whale and her baby swim right to us. Stop. There they are. They come out of the water. I'm in a boat. I'm touching them. The whale's eye is here and the whale's looking at me, studying me. Like what are these things that live in this world that I'm required to breathe in? Because yeah. they're mammals. So they have to be in our world. It's like it's the opposite of us diving in the ocean. Right. We can hold our breath and swim around, but we have to come back. Well, they go into our world and then go back into theirs. Right. And so, and the mother actually got underneath her baby and raised it up so we could touch it more. She was showing off. Look at my beautiful child. Then she left us and left the baby with us. We were babysitters. She sat off to the side. She was happy. And I actually had the baby whale squirting me with water as I'd squirt him and then playing hide and seek with me, going back and forth in the boat. And he'd come out and he'd laugh. He'd make sounds. And I'm going, this is unbelievable. And I left there changed. And I, I left there and I turned to my wife drive. It was five hundred mile trip to go to this place. And I turned to my wife and I said, You know, when you get my age, you need to only concentrate on a few things. I said, I'm so inspired. I'd like to take my underwater demolition training of blowing things up and start operating against these uh fishing boats that kill right. whales and stuff. I could be pretty good at taking them out of commission. I'm well-trained at that. How'd you end up in Mexico? <laughs> Why Mexico of all places? Um, when I got out of office, Steve, I, I was young enough when I finished governor that I wanted to go on an adventure. I was still young enough, and I thought, now is the time. I finished office. I taught at Harvard, and I actually vacationed in Cabo uh, one getting out of office, then I taught at Harvard, then I went back and vacationed again because I originally wanted to live in Hawaii to retire. And then I thought, but you can't, you got to fly to Hawaii or take a boat. Mexico, you don't. You got another option. And I fell in love. There's a, where I live down there, as the crow flies, there's a city called Todos Santos. Well, that's the home of the infamous Hotel California where allegedly the song was written because right. it fits it perfect. And whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's still cool. It's unique. If it's not true, it's a hell of a myth. Well, then how did you go well, around Well, what happened? My, well, my second trip, I rented a Jeep. Cause I, cause, and here's what I'm getting to. If you go to the Baja where I go, just as in the lyrics to Hotel California, yeah. When you go there, if you get bit by Baja fever, which my wife and I were both bitten by it, you can check out, but you can never leave. Really? Right out of the lyrics. You can you check like out, much. but you can never, you can, you'll never leave it. You may leave it, but you never will. And I fell in love with it so much. My second trip down, I rented a Jeep and I put 1,800 kilometers on that Jeep driving. I was searching and looking for what I wanted, and I found it. Off the grid, uh, an hour from, from pavement, but an hour from town. And there's an old saying in Mexico, the rougher the roads, the better the people. Well, where I live, I broke down an H2 Hummer. So the roads are pretty rough. And so using that as the, because I have a Hummer down there, using that as the, the, the uh, as you'd say, the, the bar or whatever, 
I live amongst phenomenal people. That's why if you twist it over to the presidential race right now, I personally get offended because I'm biased when they start talking about building a wall at Mexico. I love the Mexican people. I love the lifestyle. And if they do build the wall, I've already dedicated that I will cross it the other way. Really? Into Mexico. Into Mexico. Yeah, I'll go over it. Because people need to realize that a wall works both ways. It keeps you in as well as keeping things out. And I personally don't want to live in East Berlin. All right. Need to take care of a quick thank you before we continue on. Y'all know I couldn't do this podcast if not for the sponsors and if not for you guys supporting the sponsors. So thanks to DraftKings, the destination for one-week fantasy football. And when you play one-week fantasy football, you ain't stuck with the same lineup week after week. That means you ain't got to worry about injuries, suspensions, and even underperforming players. You ain't got to waste roster space or bench space on running backs like Eddie Lacy and Todd Gurley, who just ain't living up to the fantasy hype so far this year, but who you don't want to drop in case they start coming around. At DraftKings, you don't have to troll the waiver line at 2 a.m. on Sunday morning looking for a wide receiver because you forgot yours has a bye week. At DraftKings.com slash Steve, all you got to worry about is how you're going to spend all that cold, hard cash you win. And this is a good weekend to give DraftKings.com slash Steve a try because they're hosting another huge fantasy contest with over $1 million in total prizes up for grabs. So get to DraftKings.com now and choose your players for this weekend's contest. And if you use my promo code Steve, you can play for free with your first deposit. That's promo code Steve to play for free for your share of over $1 million in total prizes this weekend. Only at DraftKings.com. Eligibility restrictions may apply. See website for details. How do people take you over there? Where? uh, In Mexico? Just in Mexico in general. I mean, you've been down there for so long now. I'm just a big gringo. Right. I mean, in fact, I went to a no thing. issues, no fears. I mean, I know you have a you have a guard dog. Yeah, never have used him. But was your wife on board with you when you went down there? Yeah. How have you been married since 1975? How I mean, to be a successful pro wrestler, a successful politician, <laughs> a best-selling author, through all the trials and tribulations of all those three lives? Yeah. How? What is the key? What is the key? The the, the first key is love your wife. And realize that she's part of you and you can't get along without her. And my wife is my partner. And if I lose her, I've lost half of me. Uh, I, I couldn't do what I do without her. I don't have an entourage. I don't have all that. My wife does the computer. My wife books me. My wife is my assistant. Right. As well as my lover, as well as my partner. And and she's been that way. You remember in my world of wrestling, I was a loner. Right. I didn't hang out. I didn't go to the bars. You know, I was a loner. And I did that for many reasons. Uh, I learned early on that, you know, generally anytime something happens after midnight, it's not going to be good. <laughs> well, true. When did you if, meet your wife? I, I met her. Because after, you got into pro wrestling, what, 75? Five. You started with Sharky. Yeah. You got on the road, went down to Kansas City. Yeah, well, I... This I, is coming out of the Navy SEALs. Well, I met her in between. I had come out of the Navy, and I rode with the Mongols for a while, and then I went back home, and I went to junior college for a year not knowing what I was going to do. I was on the GI Bill, and I thought about pro football because it was actually at the time when the NFL had that first strike back in the 70s, yeah. so they were hiring scabs, and I thought about it. I thought, God, I should just try out for the Vikings. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. But I knew the gold guys would be back, and once yeah. they came back, then I'd lose my eligibility. I wouldn't be able to play in college because I'd be a pro at that time. So I went to junior college with the intent of playing JC football and then getting a college scholarship to a big school. Well, it was while I was in college uh, in the weight room, all the guys were wrestling fans and they would go to the matches. And it was a little before that I was introduced to an infamous character by the name of superstar Billy Graham. And I don't care what anybody says, superstar Graham had more influence on res- young wrestlers at that time than anyone. Hulk Hogan, me, 
every he, Graham was the first bodybuilder type that came yeah. in kissing biceps and doing all. All I did was steal Billy's gimmick. Right. And in fact, Vern Gagne had me do it. When I came to the AWA, the first thing he said to me is, can you do Superstar Graham? I said, I can do it better than he can. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Vern goes, that's what I want because he had just lost Graham and he needed a replacement for him. But speaking of Superstar Billy Graham, you know, he, he, his style in the ring, your style in the ring, when it comes to promos, he had that kind of list along the lines of a Dusty Rhodes type thing, but you had your voice, and it was kind of still an evolution as I watched yeah. your early promos from AWA until it, until it ended up with your commentary with WWF and yep. what it is now. But just going through the paces, have you always had the gift of gab? I think so, and I think I got it from my dad. Really? Yeah, because I dedicated my f- previous book to my mother and father. And I, I, they both I, served in World War II? Yeah, they're both WW2 what veterans. Kind of parents, what kind of parents were they? Great parents. To, to, they were they? working parents, though. Right. I was a latchkey kid. But what values did they instill in you? Like? Independence. Independence. Being able to take care of yourself, that nobody's going to look out for you but you. And and uh, my parents were very independent. I left every mo- well. Getting back, let's finish the wife story. Uh, it was in that transition that uh, I s- took a second job working as a bouncer, and I had just I was in wrestling training, and I had gone so boldly I had already bleached my hair blonde. Just as a, as a lark with my buddies at college, because we'd go and cheer for Graham, and everyone hated us. You know, we'd be down there cheering for the heels, and uh, and so uh, I, I was bouncing in the bar, and this girl came in, and I I was still. I'll say timid because I had spent 17 months in Southeast Asia. And when you come back to America, there's certain things frighten you. And one of the things that I had a hard time relating to was women in the United States. It was just difficult. And so I remember when my wife walked in, I was there with about four cops. We worked this thing and she walked in and our eyes locked on each other. And I told myself, God, you've got to say something. You've got to get the courage. You've got to find it here. Yeah. There was just something. Well, she got ID'd, so when she got to me, I just said, what? And so I said, excuse me, can I see some ID, please? And she goes, but I just showed him. And, I, and, and so she dug around, handed me her license, and I saw the name, I, and, and it was Teresa. And I handed it back. I said, thank you, Teresa. And, and I said, I didn't really want to know how old you were. I just wanted to know your name. <laughs> and that was my pickup line. She came up later in the night, and we started talking. And what really hooked me was I found out her father used to watch wrestling every night, every week on TV. And she remembered when the crusher was a bad guy, yeah. a villain. And I thought, this woman has something here. She knows wrestling. She's a fan. And that, and by that time, I was now focused. I thought wrestling's for me because, number one, it gives me the athleticism of football. And But even bigger, when I was in college, I got, inter- I got interested in theater. Yeah. And I did Aristophanes, The Birds, and I loved theater. So this was the combination. This combination. And I thought, this is it. Okay. This is theater and athleticism combined, and I can create. But then comes the road. Yep. So you, you got the best of both worlds. Well, I, I went down to Kansas City single. And that was with re- Central States, right? Yeah. Is that Bob Geigel? Bob Geigel, Pat How O'Connor. I was working with him. He was great. I like Bob. Pat O'Connor. He was a shit. <laughs> Shooter? What, what was he? Well, what was he... Deal? Pat made me go to the ring with him because I was new. He made me go to the ring with him in the afternoon, and he basically stretched me. Right. You know, and I, you know, what would I need that for? I'd already trained for nine months. What at oh, this yeah. point in time? Why do I need to be months. stretched? You know, why? I, I understand, but and and the way they stretched you also got me because you gave yourself to them. Yeah, it's yeah. a completely different thing if they tell you heads up. Defend yourself. Yeah. Well, I might have did some different things then, you know, other than a wrestling move of locking up the way you're trained yeah. to do it, and then the guy takes you down and stretches you. Well, it's like the stories I heard from Stu Hart. I mean, you know, the legendary Stu Hart. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. the, the, the dungeon. Sure. Sure. You know, you're basically giving yourself to him. I mean, you know, hey, how's that kid? How's that? So you're being stretched by the guy, but 
you're, you're there, and then you're going to go to AWA later. But what were you working as then down there with Pat O'Connor working for Geigel? Heel. Okay, I, you're working heel, but what was your name? Surfer Jesse Ventura. Because I, 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 wanted, I wanted to be from California, and I surfed when I was younger in the Navy and all that. And I thought, who do they hate more than a beach bum? Which is what they right. classify a surfer, even though they're not. It's like a, surfing's like a religion. And that you wouldn't call a religious bum, you know. But, but so I thought, surfer Jesse Ventura is a great from Cal- San Diego, California. And bleach blonde hair, just sits on the beach with women all day. He, he's this guy that, that can kick everybody's butt, but yet when the going gets tough, he's a coward. <laughs> <laughs> but you were already thinking about this at the formative years, man. Oh, yeah. I was riding down the road in Tennessee, and, you know, Dutch had already, Dutch Mantell had already called me stunning Steve Austin. I was a cocky, arrogant hill. Sure. That was the end of it. I, I didn't put anything behind the gimmick. You were already thinking about... The showbiz aspect oh, yeah. of it, you know, before you were probably even mechanically inclined. I mean, to me, I mean, because you just came out of wrestling school. Yeah. So you're not going to be the greatest yet. Right. But you're forward thinking because you're already thinking about the gimmick. Do you know what made me feel good? I had my first match in Wichita, Kansas, and I'll never forget it with Omar Atlas. Do you know him? No. Hell of a good little worker. You know, stocky built uh, uh, Latino guy, Omar Atlas. And... uh Geigel come up to me that night, and he says, well, kid, you know, nobody wins their first match. I said, I know. He turns to Omar said, Omar, this is this kid's first match. He said, take care of him out there. And he gave Omar the option. He said, if the, Geigel says, if the match is the sh- hit him with two drop kicks and cover him, one, two, three. He said, if the match is good, have him throw you out over the top rope, because in those days, that was a disqualification. Yeah. So he left it to Omar. Omar could have put himself over. We got through at the match, or during the match, came time, Omar whispers to me, over the top, kid. And so I tossed him over the top, kept my heat. Of course, you lose, but you don't really lose because he's on the floor. You're prancing around. But I always respected Omar for that. I thought, here's a guy who saw my potential, and he didn't put himself in front of it. So years later... When I was broadcasting for Vince, Omar used to come in as one of the job guys. I would put him over on the mic. Unbelievable. No matter if he lost, I still made him look good on the mic. And I thought, here's payback, Omar. For you taking care of me, I'm taking care of you now. I remember, I want to jump ahead just with a quick story. In 92, when you came to WCW, one of the things I was so thankful for was, maybe you were just doing your job, but you always took care of me down there. Because I liked you. I know. I saw I talent in you. I, I never forgot it. Well, no, I, I saw a talent. When I, I went to WCW, and I'll tell you honestly, I went there just for the money. Right. They gave me big money to come down because I was a steal from Vince. Correct. You yeah. know, and Vince booted me out. You know why, don't you? Yeah. Because I wouldn't sell my copyrighted likeness to him. Oh, I, I didn't know it. that was the final straw. Oh, yeah. The final straw was I, I own Jesse the Body Ventura. I own the copyright of it, and I refused to let him have it without him giving me some type of royalties for it. And that was and, and I had a video game at the time that was interested in using me, and Vince wouldn't let me do it. And so that's when I quit and left him because I said, Vince, you don't own me. I own me. I was Jesse the Body before I ever came here. I have that in my notes. When did you copyright Jesse the Body Ventura? Because nobody at that time had the wherewithal to trademark something. I that was d- probably the first time ever. I don't know. I just did it in the mi- I did it in the early '80s when I took the name because I thought, uh, you know, I don't want anybody having this but me. I want to own. I'm Jesse Ventura. I made the name up. I love the name Jesse. I wanted to be from California, so I matched it up to a map. And when I saw Ventura, it had the ring. So I created it, and so I, I felt I deserved the t- of well, being yes. the creator, the copyright of it. So I don't know why, but I, I had enough sense to know copyright this with the federal government. And so Vince could never own my name. He had to license it through me. But was it the video game that was a tipping point? Yep. And, and the fact that you wouldn't sell the name? Yep. God dang it. And that's, that's what he let me go. He couldn't, he couldn't allow anyone out of the circle. Right. And then and then the reason I beat him in court was he he could have won cuz he's not required to pay royalties. 
but it came out in court certain people were getting royalties. It's called quantum merit. Yes. Hogan got royalties. Cindy Lauper got royalties. Mr. T got royalties. But they were kayfabe and everybody else. Yep. And they lied. They take care of and they, they lied of in negotiations because when I, the, if you'll yeah. recall, when the night I went into the Hall of Fame, I said, the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that I was the first wrestler that introduced Vince to an agent. Yeah. And, oh, God, you should have seen Vince out in the crowd. He was ready to punch me. You know, if that's the thing he wants to be remembered for. But it worked because my agent protected me. But you only got the agent because of predators, right? Yeah. A predator. Yeah. But I had to quit Vince. Right. You told him, hey, man, it's too good of a gig. Well, did you hear the story? Yeah. About how Vince wasn't going to let me do it? Yeah. Yeah, and I had to quit. I said, I quit. I said, I'm, who's going to get a chance to co-star with Arnold? I said, I can always come back to wrestling. That'll, I said, I quit. So I left. And, and then it was during then that Arnold approached me about the running man. And so I inked that before I, Vince sent word he wanted to talk to me because NBC main event was hit, hitting on him. Where's Jesse Ventura? Because they bought it with you. With me. Yeah. And I wasn't there. And so I waited till I signed the running man and had it in my pocket for the fall. Right. Then I went to Vince, and I told him, well, Vince, I'm not going to talk to you unless you talk to my agent. He handles my career completely, and you're the only one that he doesn't. And Vince argued, and I said, well, it ain't good enough. Here's his number. So Vince, of course, got he didn't do it. He got a, uh, somebody else to act as his agent. But they lied, because every year I'd negotiate, we would ask, what about videotape royalties? We don't pay them. Well, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to lie during a negotiation, yeah. and that's how I won the case. And I call it, Steve, my wrestling retirement because I get, I've get i gotten quarterly checks since 1990, whatever it was, right. and some of them are pretty healthy. Yeah. They're not so big today because it's years have gone by, but I, I've gotten checks that are upwards of six figures in royalty yeah. payments. And I call it my book. I said, I'm the only wrestler that has a retirement. <laughs> hey, going to the... Uh, That's why Vince won't bring me back, like to the manias, like he'll bring you back and all this. He won't bring me back because then by law, he's required to pay me royalties if he produces it. Well, right. I want to go back. I want to... We're going to end up talking about the 2009 Raw that you returned to as sure. you the, the guest GM. But when I left the business, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and when I left the business, I wasn't ready to. My neck was telling me, hey, you need to get out of here. Yeah, so for three wise. years, I just kind of did nothing in San Antonio. A lot of hunting, fishing, and like I said, quite frankly. Fortunately, drinking. you made a lot of money, though. Yes, sir. So you're Correct. in good shape there. And I was in good shape. But I figured, hey, man, it's time to get off your ass and I get out to L.A. Do something. Because before you know, I was in the wrestling business, I was driving a forklift. And, and the wrestling game teaches you a lot of things, but it doesn't qualify you for anything nothing, else in life. Nothing. So, you know when I faced that, Steve? When, when I had the blood clots. Yes. The night before Hogan. Right. I, I laid in bed going, I had two children, and I'm going, if I can't wrestle again, what do I do? You know, 3M's not going to hire me. Uh, no. You know, and I'm not qualified to do anything. But when I came out to Los Angeles, I started taking some meetings, and I would get this time after time. You know, we were trying to get a hold of you back when you were with the WWF because we wanted you in this or that or whatever. And they didn't and tell like, you. Are you kidding me? They didn't tell you. You're right. I was so hot, I was pulling the wagon. So if you got a lead horse pulling the wagon, you don't want your lead horse going off and doing what you were able to do. Yep. So... You missed opportunities, but do you know you know what finally got it for me. I let Vince in when I did the first episode of Hunter, the TV show yes, with yes. Freddie Dreyer, yeah. and I got my royalty or my check for it. And Vince took Vince took a forty percent commission producers fee, executive, and producer. I and I said that's ridiculous. Nobody takes more than ten. Well, how the hell does this guy take? Because I found out Barry, my agent, called me and said, did you get your check from Hunter? I said, yeah, I got my, and I said what I got. And he went dead silent on the other end. I said, why, Barry? What was the payment supposed to be? He said, well, you better call the WWE, WWF and have him say I can talk money. So I called Ed Cohen. I said, yeah, I threatened him. I said, Ed, you call Barry Bloom and tell him he can talk money with me or I'm going to beat the shit out of you next time I see you. And so he, scared. he called Barry and says, yeah, you can. And then I found out I had a $1,500 payoff, and Vince paid me 700 That's what it was. 
Barry Bloom got his 10% cut, yeah. and Vince took... My check was for $700 when the payoff was 15 Barry Bloom got 150 Vince took the rest. And I thought, I'm eliminating him. He didn't do nothing. I got this part. He had nothing to do with it whatsoever. This is the Steve Austin Show. Did you know that right now GEICO is offering an extra 15% credit on car, motorcycle, and RV policies? That's 15% on top of the money GEICO could already save you. So what are you waiting for? Your dog to make your breakfast in bed? With Belgian waffles and a fresh food compote? As nice as that sounds, that's probably never going to happen. But at least there's never been a better time to switch to GEICO. Save an extra 15% when you switch by October 7th. Visit GEICO.com to learn more. When you first got out, you've always said that pro wrestling got you ready for politics, got you ready for acting because of being behind the stick and sure. just on the, on the gig. Yep. Did being in the Navy SEALs help you for professional wrestling? Because I would think you were oh, yeah. a physical specimen. It, 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 it not only did it make me physically prepared for it, it made me mentally prepared right. for it because the thing that going through BUDS or basic underwater demolition SEAL when you graduate because only about 25 to 20% of the right. people make it, the thing that that really instills in you is the will never to quit. That no matter how tough it's going or how sad you're feeling for yourself, most of the time it's your own sadness that's doing it. Pick yourself up. You've been, whenever I would get in a situation, whether it wrestling or anything, where the going got tough, God, I'd think back to Bud's and going, this ain't nothing compared to lifting telephone poles in the mud when you haven't slept for two days. Right. <laughs> you know, what the hell? This is a piece of cake compared to what I was trained and you know, prepared at. But fortunately, I was 18, 19 years old when I did it, and your body can do all that then. But, no, I've used my Navy training. It's also made me punctual. I'm the type of person that I do not like arriving not on time. And that comes right from the military because in in the military, uh, you know, if you're told to be there at 8 o'clock, you're there at 7.55. Right. 8 o'clock don't mean 8.02. And if that happens to you in the military, oh, you're going to pay a dear price for being late. Late is not accepted in the military. Listen to you talk. Go back to promos for just a second. I'm jumping all over the place sure. with you. Who did you like listening to in the business? It's, I know, I know Graham. Billy Graham. Graham. I, I know. You know how Dutchie? much? You, wait. You know how much I liked Graham? My buddy taped all his interviews on a cassette, and we used to drive around at night, and I'd listen to them over and over and over again. Really? Oh yeah. I would. We had nothing but superstar Graham interviews. Probably a dozen of them. All on a cassette player, and I would li- as I drive, I would listen to Graham and listen to his rap and listen to, you know, the way he did it. Well, with that comes, and a lot of things I like about you know his promos, your promos, uh, your commentary, or speakers that are running for politics, is cadence, delivery, uh, pacing. You know, when I watch some of the the GOP stuff, we will get into politics in a minute if you want to. But man, it's speech patterns. To me, it's natural now. Well, right. But but don't you think that's a key thing is to try to rope someone in or to command their attention or to keep them riveted? I'm sure, Absolutely. you want to have some good content, but if you're not, you're very convicted in everything you say. I think that's a big part of a great sure. promo. If you don't if you don't believe it, even though it could be totally out of left field or from a heel perspective, well, who else is going to believe I'll, it? I'll give Vince credit for that in a way. Saying you could have carte blanche at the gig? Vince, I'll never forget. Well, let's pick us up from the blood clots. Well, yeah. When, pre, okay. Pre-Hogan run. Okay, when I went down with the blood clots, I was due to go around with Hogan in a three-match program. God knows how much money that cost me. Right. I mean, you know, you're talking know. major league money. Yes. With the champ three-match program, and I lose it. Uh, my dear old, the late John Studd replaced me. Bless him. Yeah. He would have been probably my first choice if I said, if give him the money. You know, yeah. Big John, because I love Big John. We traveled together. One of the few guys I would travel with was John Studd. Well, while I was laying in bed, I went through the dilemma of what am I going to do? If I can't wrestle again, if this is the end of my career, what the hell am I going to do? 
go back in the Navy? Well, yeah, because you you're know? about to blow stuff up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What am I going to do? Well, then when I was convalescing, and I'll give Vince credit, he paid me while I was out. Oh, wow. That's Not gross. a lot, but he gave me 1000 a week. Wow. You know, That's he, unheard of. Yeah, he paid me. When a, I got fused up in 2000. He paid me yeah. $1,000 a week. Well, I knew he wasn't going to keep doing that without getting something right. out of the, the skin or the hide. So he called me one day, and it was his idea. He said, Jesse, I got an idea, an explosive one. No one's ever put a heel on the mic. He said, do you think you could do color commentating while you recoup? I said, sure, I can do that. And so he came up to me, and I'll never forget the first night I was going out with Monsoon. And Vince comes over to me, and I give him credit. He said, Jesse, here's how I want you to broadcast. This is your mental position. If you believe it, it's true. (laughs) That's all he said to me. If you believe it, it's true. And he sent me out with that to where I could do anything I wanted. And I really had for a time, the greatest job in the world, because I, there was a point I worked one day every three weeks. I made unbelievably good money and I got to insult my boss on a regular basis on nationwide television. And he loved it. You couldn't get in trouble for me insulting the boss. <laughs> what was your preparation? Well, well first of all, we're nothing talking about talking. Okay. Nothing. Okay. Before that, no, no preparation on commentary. Then no, you just show up and react. I react. I remember when I went to the first Saturday night main event, NBC. Here we are now with Dick Ebersol, seven cameras, nine cameras. NBC's come in. Holy, what is this? And I remember going up to the broadcast thing, and there was this big spiral notebook up there, and I opened it. And it was, Vince says this, Jesse says this, Vince says this, Jesse says this. And I read it, and Dick Ebersol walked by. I said, Dick, come here. I said, what's this? That's your script. I looked at Dick. I said, Dick, I said, two years ago, you didn't give a rat's ass about wrestling. I said, now we're the hottest thing out there, and I'm happy you're here. We're all on board. But I said, who in your staff of writers is qualified to write for Jesse the Body Ventura? I know wrestling. They don't. I said, no one. You have no one who can write for me. No one can do it. Only I can. Dick Ebersol was so good and so professional. He sat there a moment. And he kind of furrowed his brow a little. He said, you're right. Push that to the side. Don't even worry about it. I went, thank you, Dick. See, he, he got it that my res- I respond to what happens in front of my eyes. I can't go on something that's pre-written to do wrestling, and nobody can write and tell me how I would respond to nobody. it. Nobody. But also, you said, like... Uh... In your debates, you, no notes. No. In your speeches, uh, other mayor than, or governor. You... Other than the state of the state. Okay. The state of the state, you have to be exact, and you do that off a teleprompter. And you go in and practice it. But otherwise, you <laughs> other, were just I straight up ad lib. Yeah, always. I never used a prepared do speech. Do you have a photographic memory? No. You obviously have a great memory. I don't but know. But you also have the I have a hard do. time doing scripts sometimes. Right. But No, if somebody writes me a script... I have I have some difficulty in taking those words into memory. Okay, because I love Predator so much. I mean, but you Predator's lying, one-liners. You, you yeah, that's what I was going to say. You're <laughs> lying heavy there, but okay. So then, with anything, the, do the you, most I don't like memorizing stuff. The most difficult script I ever did, and I don't know if you've ever seen my episode of the X Files. Oh, you need to see my X Files episode where I play a man in black. And the X-Files, oh boy, is that, they wrote stuff there, Steve, I got to, I didn't even know what I was talking about. You know that, uh, who's the guy that does X-Files? I forget his name, he's real famous now. Don't ask me. Well, anyway. So, but you memorized it all, right? Yeah. You just didn't know what you were saying. Yeah, I just didn't know what I was saying (laughs) because it was so x file It was like, I was a man in black. And it's a great story, it's called Jose Chung. Uh, something, uh, something or other, and the guy who was in it was Charles Nelson Riley. Remember him? Yeah. yeah, he's got one of the lead roles in it, and it's a great episode. It got rated one of the top ten uh, X File episodes in history. 
Okay, well, let me ask you a question. You, you do Predator, you got Running Man, I can list a, a slew of movies you did, some of the yep. television stuff. Yep. What said to you, or how did you just say, I'm done with acting, it's time to go do this? No, I, ne- I never said it. I didn't make the right choice. How? Well, when I was down in Mexico, Arnold said to me one day, Jesse, when are you going to move to L.A. and become one of the boys? And I turned to Arnold, and I had two small children then. My kids were young then. This was the 80s, late 80s. And I said, well, Arnold, I said, how are the schools? And he thought he gave me the best answer, but he gave me the worst one. He looked at me and said, oh, you don't worry about that. You send your kids to private school. Well, to me, I sat and thought, do I want my children growing up in a city where they're required to go to private school? where the public school system is so bad and living there is so bad. In Minnesota, our public school system is award-winning. And I thought, I'm not taking my kids and raising them in L.A. So I didn't move out here. I stayed in Minnesota, and Steve, it hurt me. Because like anything, you know it out here, out of sight, out of mind. You got to be here. You got to do the negotiating. You got to do the dinners. You got to do all the behind the scenes, lack of better term, bullshit. Right. You know, you got to do that. I didn't, because of my children, and I don't regret it today at all. I felt my kids were better raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota than they would ever be raised out here. And my son learned quick enough because when he turned 19, guess what his first job was? He was assistant to Sean Penn. Now, if that don't teach you Hollywood, nothing will. No, my son developed a report, and Sean Penn had him as his assistant for three years. He was with him when he won the Academy Award for Mystic River, when he uh, he, uh, directed Jack Nicholson in The Pledge. My son was right with him, and Sean taught him the ropes of Hollywood. And today, my son got nominated for an Emmy, and he does his own show on Russian TV called the Hawks. Would I know when you wrestled you had a passion for the business because you, you grew up watching it. Yeah. And then it was the best of both worlds, athletically and thea- thea- theatrically. So you got into the business. There was a passion there. Did you have the same passion for acting that you did for the wrestling business? Or was it just something to do because you weren't wrestling anymore? A no. part of the evolution. No, I had the passion for it, but I didn't have the passion for the networking. I had the passion to do, I loved it. There isn't a more fun thing to do than a movie. I mean. Oh, I disagree. I just, I, oh, I don't, I, the, the, just, I, I, the, I, the setups, to me, the, the and, marks, and to me, takes, well, yeah. and I like it, I'll tell you what, I like it when you go to location. Right. Because then you become a family. You're all away. I hate doing movies in L.A. because everybody goes home at the end of the day, and you don't. If you don't live here, you go to a hotel. That's why when we did Predator, we were on location in Puerto Vallarta, staying all in one hotel. Then you become a family. Then you, there, uh, to me, there's more camaraderie in the finished product right. of knowing we did this all together from the prop master to the whatever, and da 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 da. We we it required us all to do it. How was uh, working on Predator? Because I know you had fun. I know you were Ribbon Arnold, the Jim stories. Yeah, with uh, you and or him and Sven or whoever's bodyguard. Sven, Sven was. Yeah. So you get to the gym early, but John McTiernan says, "Man, when Jesse first came on." And it looked like you were full of piss and vinegar at that time. But he had to dial you down a little bit. Yeah. Was it because you were so big because you're used to playing the wrestling audience? No. W- oh, what, no. What was the story? It was because I went back. What do you mean? I went back. I actually uh, um, I actually had a few dreams oh, down there. So you went what? back to Vietnam? Uh-huh. Oh. Uh-huh. That's where it came from. I was back. The smell. Oh. The weapons. The shooting. Amazing. I went back. No, no, it, wrestling had Did nothing to do with it. Did you ever need a time to say, guys, I can compose myself or what? I never had to get to that point, but I remember my wife came down and told me that at one point I bolted straight up in the middle of the night, and I exclaimed, don't worry, the area's all secure, and, I, and then rolled over and went back to sleep again, and she was startled because in our life together I had never had any type of thing like that happen before. But when I went to do Predator... Old things came out. Yeah. Old, old. And see, for me, it was an easy movie to do because I just went back to what I was trained to do. Well, you knew how to do everything. Uh Uh-huh. 
And I actually, me and Gary Goldman were the, uh, were the uh, uh, we were there a week ahead of time, and we were the ones that taught them how. Gary's an old Green Beret. And uh, we taught the patrolling. He would always put me at rear security so I could watch everybody else and then critique at the end. Of, and and I, I feel proud because I've had many military people come up to me and say that the patrolling in Predator is the most authentic they've ever seen because yeah. we kept our spacing. I used to fight with McTiernan on that. I'd go, you got everyone cramped up. One round in the middle, you lose your whole platoon. What the hell? And I had to learn, we're shooting a movie. We're not doing a documentary. This isn't Navy SEAL training film. This is you're doing a movie for entertainment. But to that point, you wanted to be authentic if you're going to represent. Well, I that mean, just you, came out in me yeah. because I sat, you've got us too crowded together. We're in daylight. We would have 10 meters between us all. You don't want it to where one guy could take out half the platoon. Oh, I have no actual <laughs> training whatsoever, but obviously that makes sense. Had you not had the blood clots, had you done the run with Hogan, had you remained physically healthy enough to stay in the ring, speculation, how much longer would you have stayed in the business? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows if you'd ever got to broadcasting? Because yeah. to me, as good as yeah. you were in the ring, you were ten times as good on the mic. Yeah. I hope well, that's a compliment. Know, oh, yes. No, I, it's a compliment because in my day of wrestling, I remember old timers would tell me, <laughs> they'd say, you don't, you don't draw, the match doesn't draw for what happens in the ring. The match is, draws for what's said on the mic. And I took that to heart right away. It's the key is what you say on the mic. The ring work is actually secondary. You have to be able to back it up. Yes. But look at how many guys were phenomenal on the mic and couldn't work a lick. Right, you or, know, or, or had said, charisma or crowd psychology, because one of the things I want to yeah. ask you, because you're, you're so good at explaining things and just <laughs> a passion that many people can understand, what do you think is the key to getting over, and let's just say the business of wrestling, it could almost be a parallel of getting an acting business, but let's talk... And getting elected. Yes, because, like you said, I know you're, saying, key, you're selling yourself, no, the, but... Yeah, well, the key, the key to it's me... It's a talent, charisma... What is it? Well, it's talent, it's charisma, it's focus, and it's also you have to immediately I would go to the ring and find the first mark I could that would interact with me, and I'd draw him out, he or she. And the minute you involve the crowd, you got him. Right. You got it. You got it. I remember people ask me, who is your favorite person to wrestle? And I'd always go Tito Santana. Because I knew for, you liked him. for some reason, Tito and I style blended perfect, and Tito knew me, knew how I needed to work, and was he was so wonderful. He and I, we had cases where the announcer would say, 10 minutes gone, and we hadn't touched. <laughs> and the match was, te- and, and yet the people had been up and down out of their seats three times, and we hadn't touched. Right. Just because, and Tito would allow me to be me, and then his timing was yes. phenomenal. When it was time for him, he trusted me and knew I'd give it to him. Yes. Because I knew th- that you got to give the baby face their due. You know, they got to beat you up at some point so you can be a coward. But when you <laughs> called him Chico, the way you said it, and you compared him to Chico and a man, but I, I figured, man, he's got to be tight with Tito because on one hand, it, it angers the people so much yeah. that it's getting him over. His name is Tito. But I just figured you guys were well, tight. Because- oh, yeah, and I did that with everybody because they were all so insignificant to me. Yeah. That's why. Why would? Because I remember the one time Vince backed down. I got involved, Coco Beware, and I sat in the B, right? And my mind started going. I thought, oh, I got this. So I went to Coco ahead of time because I knew it was going to be borderline. And I said, Coco, I told him what I wanted to do, and Coco was great. He looked at me, you know what he said to me? He goes, body, because that's what they call it. He goes, body, you say anything you want about me. Because he said, when you talk about me, I make money. And so I got Coco's complete blessing when I told him. So I get out there that night and I tell McMahon, McMahon, I says, you know, Coco, beware. You know what the B stands for, don't you? Vince goes, what? I said, Buckwheat. I said, that's Buckwheat's grandson. Coco, Buckwheat, where? And I went through the whole spiel on, right? Vince, then the NAACP comes down on him and he won't fight them. 
he gives in and censors me. And I thought, how can you do this when Coco said it was okay? And here was my argument, Steve. At that very time on Saturday Night Live, Eddie Murphy was doing buckwheat. Yes. So it's okay for Eddie to do buckwheat, but it's not okay for me? Excuse me, that's discrimination. That is discrimination. How come Eddie can do buckwheat and I can't? And when they say buckwheat is this weird black... Well, all the kids in our gang were weird. Was Alfalfa the normal white kid? (laughs) Look at it this way. The our gang was the first integrated neighborhood on TV. That in itself is monumental. That buckwheat was an equal to all these other little kids. And Coco didn't have, but Vince backed down. He wouldn't take on the fight. And I lost a little respect for him because I thought I was right. I said, how come Eddie can do it and I can't? All right, everybody, give me the go-home cues. Time to wrap up this podcast and ride off into the sunset. Before I do that, I'll give you guys something to watch on YouTube. All you got to do is go to YouTube and type in Jesse Ventura or Jesse the Body Ventura. You can find him wrestling Hulk Hogan from the AWA in 1982. I believe that was on Christmas night. You can find some of his interactions with uh, Vince McMahon doing color commentary. Anything you want, just go to YouTube and check out the guy if you've never seen him or never heard from him. Hey, man, Jesse Ventura is a very smart guy. He's had a hell of a damn interesting life. It was wonderful to finally hook back up with Jesse. He came by the house. He was here early, caught me completely off guard. I think it's the earliest podcast I ever did. I'm proud of the podcast because I had a great conversation with him. And I did a lot of research on Jesse, and I knew all of his stories. I knew his loops. And he gets a couple in on me, but we tried to just talk a lot about wrestling and everything else. We'll talk more about the book on part two this coming Tuesday. Remember, Thursday is part two of my conversation with the whole up and show. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of the Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com.